A very good evening and thank you for joining us here in, on this edition on, of the English News here on Rwanda Television. Let's begin with a look at the key stories making headlines tonight. The government of Rwanda con remains steadfast in its commitment to supporting ongoing peace efforts aimed at resol resolving the conflict in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. The implementation of the agreed goals of the East African community has proven to be instrumental in driving the development and integration of the region. On the international scene in Southern California, what was once America's second largest landfill is on its way to becoming a recreational park. My name is Olive Neden. It's always a pleasure to have you with us. Let's now kick off this edition. Members of the Board of Directors of the United Nations World Food Programme have held discussion with Rwanda's Prime Minister, Dr. Edouard Ngirene, and the talks focused on promoting cooperatives led by women and youth engaged in agriculture. The delegation led by and Andreas von Brandt visited various projects including agriculture and livestock initiatives, refugee programs and observed the positive impact of the school feeding program. We have uh, discussed the findings of our mission. We went to the southern provinces. We visited um, uh, the cooperative, the agricultural cooperatives. We visited some refugee camps, but also agribusinesses, young startups, but also big agribusinesses. And so with the prime minister, we had now the opportunity to discuss the importance of agri-food systems, the importance of food security, how important food security has to be handled by all ministries. There is education involved, uh, there is of course agriculture and uh, um, uh, emergencies, because one of the biggest achievements, and we made that very clear, is your uh, school feeding program. Rwanda's Minister of Agriculture and Animal Resources, Dr. Mark Chubahiro uh, Bagabe, highlighted that WFP is a key partner in Rwanda's second national strategy for transformation. They first appreciated our country, that that's a country that is beautiful, they appreciated uh, the mileage our government has covered. Um, uh, that's what they expressed to the Right Honourable Prime Minister. And um, they uh, they committed to uh, partner with the Rwanda uh, in ensuring that we, we implement our um, national strategic uh, programs, our long vision and our NST2 program and uh, specifically um, in agriculture and supporting education uh, within the school feeding uh, program. Uh, we discussed issues of uh, climate change and uh, they agreed that uh, they are going to be partners um, in uh, uh, combating climate change. Um, one of the areas where they have been uh, collaborating with our government is um, in tree planting, uh, specifically trees for uh, fruits to ensure that we also reduce malnutrition. The discussions also explored enhancing collaboration to promote the use of modern agricultural tools adapted to local conditions, aiming to boost productivity and sustainability. Moving on to other matters, the government of Rwanda remains steadfast in its commitment to supporting ongoing peace efforts aimed at resolving the conflict in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. In an exclusive interview earlier with RBA, Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation Ambassador Olivier Nduhunjirehe emphasized the importance of tackling the root causes of the crisis to achieve lasting stability in the region. Thank you, Honorable Minister, for granting this opportunity to us uh, to speak about regional affairs with an emphasis on security matters uh, in the region as well. On the 25th, uh, on Monday, November, we're in a meeting in Luanda, Angola, uh, the sixth tripartite ministerial meeting. Um, what are some of the key points discussed in this meeting? but also what are the resolutions adopted, uh, basing or building upon the previous tripartite meetings? Before even starting uh, the consideration of the CONOPS, I made a point in the meeting uh, about uh, the implementation of uh, our document, of our agreements. Because the sixth ministerial meeting held on 25th of November followed uh, the fifth 
of course, ministerial meeting that was held on 12th of October. And then I uh, presented the situation on the ground since that period, since the 12th of October, which is alarming and shows that uh, there is a lack of uh, political will and good faith on the side of the DRC to implement our agreement. Uh, we have uh, received information that there, there are now mobilization of troops during that period, mobilization of troops of uh, uh, DRC, and there are also Burundian troops, and also uh, mobilization of uh, acquisition of a new uh, heavy weaponry on the ground, which uh, was also followed by um, at least 27 attacks against uh, M23 positions, which retaliated. Uh, this happened in the territory of Masisi and also Lubero and, um, and Nyiragongo. Uh, and we have uh, also received information on the um, troops of uh, FLN, of Poro Sesawajina, which were in Fizi territory in, southern, uh, in South Kivu, which were uh, moved close to our border. Uh, and then this situation on the ground is concerning and is um, in the context of a hate speech and uh, bellicose statements by uh, the president of the DRC himself and also other officials. Uh, the president of DRC, when he was um, visiting the province of Okatanga on 17th of November, he told uh, military and um, civilian leaders that uh, if he is given an opportunity to uh, revise the constitution, he will, he will use it for regime change in Rwanda, so to overthrow the government in Rwanda. And you have heard also recently this uh, inflammatory statement of uh, the Minister of Justice, Konstantin Mutamba, who, who uh, used insults, uh, of a call to murder, and uh, also uh, hate speech uh, against uh, the Congolese Tutsi, against the President of Rwanda, and against uh, the Rwanda as a country. Uh, so this uh, is concerning. It's even against the agreement that we signed, because during the second ministerial meeting, which uh, was uh, held on 30th of July. There is a paragraph that we added, which was that all parties agreed to avoid um, inflammatory statements and hate speech. And this is, was a blatant violation of uh, this, um, uh, this agreement. So we have adopted the CONOPS, uh, but I made that point. I present that situation on the ground that doesn't give us hope on the um, goodwill of uh, the DRC to implement what we signed. Moving ahead, you mentioned it. There is lack of political will, but also the adopted resolutions are not being implemented. What is the way forward? And what mechanisms should be put in place to ensure accountability and tangible progress from all parties involved? We have, uh, on 5th of uh, November, uh, inaugurated in Goma the ad hoc verification mechanism, which is uh, uh, composed of uh, 18 um, uh, officers from uh, Angola and uh, three liaison officers from um, Rwanda and from uh, DRC. Uh, we hope that this ad hoc verification mechanism will um, help us in uh, ensuring uh, that uh, the ceasefire is, uh, is observed but also will help us in uh, different uh, uh, operations uh, and activities that are mentioned in the CONOPS. But uh, in any case, to implement these CONOPS and the agreement we sign, we just need goodwill. We have said on several occasions that we have uh, defensive measures at the border uh, to avoid, uh, uh, to face that security threat. And those measures are, are dynamic, are uh, proportionate to the threat that we are facing. When we hear, when Constant Mutamba, for example, saying what he said, this is actually the reason why we put in place those kind of, uh, of uh, defensive measures. And uh, those measures will stay in place uh, until the CONOPS and then our agreements are implemented, meaning the neutralization of our security threat, which is the FDLR. You, you just highlighted um, the, um, I mean, the inflammatory statements by public officials, being the president, also the Minister of Justice recently in Goma. Um, 
what role should regional frameworks play in, um, in curbing such recurring events because it's been happening more than once and in further preventing the conflict from like, being bigger? The government of DRC needs to own its conflict and uh, to find a solution for that conflict. Uh, there are problems on the ground, like the problem of the Congolese Tutsi in Eastern DRC. Uh, we are talking about that movement, the M23. It's even the second M23. We had the first M23. Before the M23, there was uh, the CNDP. And then before CNDP, there was another movement, RC RCDs. So there is a problem that needs to be addressed by tackling the root causes of uh, this crisis, which is uh, the marginalization, persecution, hate speech, and, um, and so on and so forth. This is why, actually, in a meeting we had uh, on the following day, a virtual meeting on 26th of November, under the Luanda process, we, when we continued to address uh, or to consider the draft agreement that was proposed by the president of Angola, that we address that issue of M23. Because there are three issues, security issues between DRC and Rwanda. There is that FDLR, the defensive measures, and the third is that of the M23. The two first issues were somehow addressed in the CONOPS. But there is that remaining issue that should be addressed as well. And uh, we have uh, made proposal, and we believe that uh, before we sign any agreement, between the, with the DRC, this issue needs to be addressed. And then for Rwanda, we have been clear, we have been saying that there, there is a need for a commitment by the DRC to engage in direct talks with M23 with a view to, to finding a lasting and final solution to this crisis. As we sum up our interview, uh, the upcoming 24th Ordinary uh, Summit of EAC Heads of State is underway and presents an opportunity for advancing regional integration and security. What key priorities will Rwanda, Rwanda advocate uh, for during this summit, particularly in the context of current regional challenges? We have always been um, advocating for more integration. You know that uh, the East African community is made of uh, four, uh, four uh, levels or four uh, steps. Uh, pillars. Uh, there is uh, the, the customs union, there is uh, the common market, there is uh, the common uh, currency, and then political confederation. Now we are at the second uh, pillar, the second level of uh, common uh, market, so free movement of people, of goods, services, and labor. And uh, we are advocating for more integration and uh, to lift uh, what we call non-trade non-tariff barriers, because we, have, we, have st we still have barriers uh, in the free movement of people in our, in our region. So we always advocate for more integration and to remove all obstacles to, uh, to integration. Regarding peace and security, of course, uh, it's uh, also the EAC needs to play its role. Uh, I recall that the Nairobi process, because this is a process initiated by the East African community, and this was aimed at addressing the, uh, the conflict in Eastern DRC, tackling also the root causes, uh, and uh, promoting dialogue between the DRC government and uh, the armed groups in Eastern DRC. We always talk about the M23, but there are more than 250 groups, armed groups in Eastern DRC. So this summit will be an opportunity for the ESC to recommit to this process. Now, moving ahead on matters still in the region of EAC, the implementation of the agreed goals of the East African community has proven to be instrumental in driving the development and integration of the region. Adam Skizera has more on this. During a high-level side event that brought together ministers from the East African community member states, the Secretary General of the EAC, Veronique Andova, noted that while the EAC celebrates 25 years of integration, there is a need to establish a stable and effective mechanism for implementing some of its core principles to ensure sustainable progress. We are undertaking deliberate strategies to deepen political cooperation among partner states on governance and security matters 
And indeed, the summit has remained committed and continues to give direction towards this. Distinguished delegates, this event will focus on three key thematic areas. Number one, promoting trade. Secondly, digital transformation. And thirdly, peace and security. It is imperative for the region to leverage emerging technologies to enhance trade efficiencies and promote financial inclusion, fostering innovations. Minister of State for Regional Integration in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, retired General James Kavarebe, emphasized that the successful implementation of the EAC's principles is achievable if there is full commitment from all member states. Progress has indeed been made in implementing the customs union and common market protocols, cementing the East African community's position as a leading economic bloc in Africa. Yet intra-ESC trade remains low, underscoring the need to enhance collaboration and deepen integration. Challenges like non-tariff barriers, trade restrictions, and the absence of unified mechanisms to address external shocks are within our control and must be addressed. For the private sector, it is crucial that decision-making institutions ensure the implementation of decisions made, rather than leaving them out. Then, policy aligned with economic realities and fosters greater collaboration for regional development. Well, first of all, this is a, an interesting milestone. 25 years is not small. It's uh, time to reflect on what we have done and what the community has achieved. A lot has been achieved, to be honest, uh, as it was mentioned by the previous speakers, but there's a long way to go. There's a bigger journey to cover um, in terms of trade, in terms of uh, movement of people and goods, in terms of uh, um, um, sharing revenues from uh, uh, different aspects that we do together in terms of uh, opening up airspace, we, we still operate in, uh, independently. So there's a long way to go. Uh, but I liken this to this being the 25th year, it's a silver jubilee. If it was uh, a young man or a young woman, this is the time to get married and uh, correct the mistakes of the past. So uh, looking at the past mistakes we have done, I believe this is the time of maturity now. And at maturity, what do you expect to do if you come? become a husband and you are a single young man, you now want to perfect things because now you have a home. So ESC 25 years now, we should be now looking at our home critically and say let's correct things that we didn't do right. The integration of member states and the implementation of the East Africa community's goals were highlighted by some of the heads of state as essential pillar for building a stable regional economy. President William Ruto of Kenya emphasized that peace and security across the region are critical, asserting that with others, the development goals of the organization cannot be fully realized. And we are in support of a process rather than running two parallel processes. It is better that we have one process that would help consolidate all efforts and all actors so that again we can meaningfully contribute to the peace and stability in DRC as a way of making sure that our region has the security that we need, the stability that is necessary for us to continue the journey of building prosperity for the people of our region. This high-level side event to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the East African community was built on a theme of leveraging digital transformation to fast track the integration. Adam Squizera reporting for RTV News in Arusha, Tanzania. Thank you, Adam, for a detailed report now to financial matters. The BK has reported remarkable growth across SME retail, agribusiness, and corporate lending. And this was revealed at the bank's leadership at the release of the BK financial result for the quarter three. William Evans has more. According to BK's leadership, the registered 24.3% increase in their net income year on year and driving growth across sectors that are rather known to be riskier or with challenges accessing financing 
has been key in driving their financial success in quarter three. So we want to show that uh, Bank of Kigali and the group generally uh, being more inclusive and lending to sectors that are known to be maybe more risky um, uh, or are known to have difficulty in accessing financing. So the loans to SMEs have grown by 25%, which I believe is quite significant. And the loans to the agribusiness sector, that means cooperatives, farmers, uh, coffee, uh, tea companies, has grown to, uh, by 39%, which is, uh, I believe, uh, quite outstanding. So the, the strategy that uh, we are implementing is to diversify access to finance and democratize access to finance which we believe is quite positive. BK is uh, driving access to finance in traditionally underserved segments like agribusiness um, uh, and SMEs. Small and medium-sized enterprises, the backbone of Rwanda's economy, received an impressive 25.3% boost in their loan portfolio, which now totals to 260 billion Rwandan francs. Retail loans expanded by 26.1% to 256 billion Rwandan francs, while Agribusiness loan portfolio is reported to have grown by 39.2% to 58 billion Rwandan francs. Complementing these efforts, the corporate lending portfolio is reported to have grown by 10.1% to 972 billion Rwandan francs, yet the diaspora loan portfolio now stands at a tune of 1.7 billion Rwandan francs. William Evans, Mtawazi, RTV News. Thank you, Evans, for the details now to Agricultural Matters. The Ministry of Agriculture and Animal Resources, along with its partners, has launched the Rwanda Digital Soil Information System, a platform designed to help farmers identify suitable soil types and fertilizers based on the crops they plan to grow. This platform was developed using scientifically collected data from across the country, focusing on optimal practices for cultivating crops like rice, and potatoes. It is part of the Rwanda Soil Information System project, which aims to provide comprehensive soil data for improved agricultural practices. Where you can access the system, you can use two ways. First, to search with boundaries, where you can set the district, the sector, the cell up to the village level and you can get information about that uh, area. Uh, you can get soil information, you can get erosion information, you can get recommendation for erosion and you can also get fertilizers like potato fertilizers or rice fertilizers which we plan also to add more data. Uh, you can also search using UPI. Uh, you can uh, you can in the search uh, you can add the UPI and get the information about that specific plot. Trials conducted on soils used for potato and rice farming have shown that when compared to previous fertilizer practices, the new system has led to increased yields. And these school labs have conducted campaigns around 13 districts in Rwanda. The Osiku School Lab is majorly an awareness and educational platform. The idea for us is that we go to the districts and we educate farmers on good agricultural practices. And so far, over 20,000 farmers have been trained and the training is still ongoing. For the GIS project, the GIS project is a, um, a, develop, is a digital platform for precision agriculture. For us, to be able to train the algorithm, we are set to collect, by recording the parcels, we are set to collect data-driven insights, field detection, we, we are going to be collecting a history of, um, uh, of, the, of the soils that we are testing. It's also important to also note what the minister had mentioned, that most of the soil samples or soil tests that had been done had realized that um, we still have more potassium in the soil. But we're, with this um, platform, we intend to track you know, the health and nutrient needs of not just the soil, but also the crops. Also forecasting and also precision ag agri agronomy. That is, we're providing tailored advice to challenges that we have found in nutrient deficient soils. Significant milestone for us is that we have collected so far over 100,000 parcels and recorded with plant phenological stages in, in all the parcels that we have collected. And then we have done that for rice and um, the, we've also taken the yield um, the yield data for 4,000 parcels of rice land. One of the way forwards for us is to integrate this platform with the Rural Seed platform to have sufficient data for development of new formulas. 
The Minister of Agriculture and Animal Resources, Dr. Mark Chiwairo-Wagawe, emphasized that to further enhance productivity, efforts will be made to train farmers on how to test their soil and apply the appropriate fertilizers. The collective endeavor culminates in the creation of um, the Rwanda Digital Soil Information System, uh, developed by the Rwanda Space Agency to provide comprehensive soil nutrient map, maps and site specific fertilizer recommendations for Rwanda's key crops. Uh, these are the priority crops, about to six of them. Uh, these include uh, maize, beans, cassava, rice, and um, even potatoes. So years of this rigorous soil sampling, advanced analysis, and fertilizer response trials underpin um, this platform, ensuring that it offers accurate and actionable insights. Um, RASIS represents a ground break, uh, a breakthrough for Rwanda's agriculture. It equips our farmers with precise location-specific recommendations, enabling them to make informed decisions that enhance productivity while preserving soil health. I think you saw on the, I don't know uh, whether you showed all the slides, but some of the slides that I saw um, a couple of weeks ago indicate that we are deficient in all the key nutrients except potassium. But you can imagine the tons and tons of potassium we've been loading these soils when they are not actually deficient. So that, I think, um, underpins the importance of this work. By optimizing fertilizer use, this system not only boosts yield, but also minimizes environmental risks, reinforcing our commitment to sustainability and climate resilience. The launched Rwanda Digital Soil Information System is expected to revolutionize fertilizer use in the country. And additionally, the ministry announced the establishment of a fertilizer factory tailored to the specific agricultural zones of Rwanda, ensuring that farmers no longer use fertilizers unsuitable for their soil types. Welcome back now to matters making headlines globally. In Southern California, what was once America's second largest landfill is on its way to becoming a recreational park. VOA reports on its development in an urban environment with scare green spaces. California's Puente Hills landfill was once one of the nation's largest, collecting more than 150 million tons of trash from Los Angeles County over 56 years. Los Angeles County Supervisor Hilda Solis grew up in this area. She says the landfill was a nuisance to the predominantly Hispanic community. And even on the Pomona Freeway, which is adjacent, um, what, what this was, we weren't clear, but it smelled. There was this very toxic, kind of noxious odor that would emanate from this place. And we'd ask my dad, what is that, Dad? He goes, oh, that's the basura. The basura is trash. The landfill closed in 2013, when Salis returned to California after serving as labor secretary for President Barack Obama. She worked to make this area a park for the communities that had lived with landfill for decades. No one likes to live around places that um, have contaminants or can have harmful impacts, the methane gas and all of that. It's the time now for a community to understand that this is being returned to them. It's a good way to turn something in that had such a negative impact into something better. Park plans include 
open spaces with running paths, dog playgrounds, picnic areas, bike courses, interpretive gardens and a scenic skywalk. Landscape architect Megan Horn says putting all of that on top of a landfill brings unique challenges. This will always be a landfill. It's never going to become native land again, but we can do a lot to restore it. It has about 7 feet to 12 feet to 14 feet of soil on the top and that allows us to plant it. Planting it is actually part of some of the safety environmental control systems. Those environmental controls also include webs of pipes that vent the methane emitted by the landfill. LA County Parks and Recreation Director Norma Edith Garcia Gonzalez lives in the area. That methane is, is, is turned into energy that is put out into the grid. And we have teams of engineers. We will continue to monitor. We will continue to co-manage this park to ensure its safety. Puente Hills developers hope to replicate the successes of the South Coast Botanic Garden in Palos Verdes, developed in the 1960s. It's one of the world's first botanical gardens to be converted from a landfill. Puente Hills Regional Park breaks ground next year with the aim of opening in time for the 2028 Summer Olympics in Los Angeles. Jenya Dulo, VOA News, Los Angeles. And the story brings us to the end of tonight's bulletin, but before we leave, a reminder of our top stories. The government of Rwanda remains steadfast in its commitment to supporting ongoing peace efforts aimed at resolving the conflict in the Eastern DRC. The implementation of the agreed goals of the East African community has proven to be instrumental in driving the development and integration of the region. On the international scene in Southern California, what was once America's second largest landfill is on its way to becoming a recreational park. And this marks the end of tonight's bulletin. Thank you for tuning in to today's broadcast. And on behalf of the technical and news production team, we wish you a restful weekend.